Greetings, everyone. We are so glad for you to be here on tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, kings and queens, our convener and hosts for the Black Church in Pursuit of Economic Justice Town Hall is none other than the Reverend Dr. David Jefferson Sr. Esquire. And we are glad to bring him to the audience. Please make sure you click and share, click and share, invite others to this very powerful conversation that will take place tonight with our convener, the Reverend Dr. David Jefferson Sr. And, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm and trying to our very to own video. Roland Martin. I'm trying to start the video. Uh, producer, can you please start my video? Are we on? Hold on. We're joining you right now. Uh, my video is not on and I cannot take it. Okay. Hey, first of all, let me uh, thank you, uh, Reverend Williams. And let me take this opportunity to also thank all of the folks who have taken the time to join us tonight to be a part of one of the most important issues in our country and that is economic justice and certainly pursuing equity for black people. And so how do we do that? Number one, by being informed and knowing what's going on. And then number two, by coming together, working together and getting focused on goals and objectives. And then thirdly, by knowing where the money is, following the money, how much is being spent where, and making sure we're getting our fair share. Our communities, folks, are suffering. Our families are having some very hard and difficult times. And our young adults are asking the question, how can I make it? What about my career? And what about our future? And so the purpose of tonight's town hall is to bring to the table some of the most prominent voices in the black church from around the country to focus on this issue. Now the black church has always been on the forefront of serving our people and addressing challenges that are liberating in nature. And so it is that economic wealth and freedom is no exception. So just imagine this town hall tonight could be a turning point, a moment to re-energize and empower the pew and all of our churches across this country to engage in the dismantling of systemic discriminatory economic systems that have kept a large percent of our people in poverty. This could be, beyond a doubt, a defining and pivotal moment for the church to get out in front and own this economic revolution. And so we have with us tonight uh, some individuals who have certainly been on the forefront. And I am excited about tonight. I wanna first of all, thank all of our participants tonight. And then I also wanna ask that you would reach out to someone right now, you know, ping someone right now and um, encourage them to join this town hall, listen into this town hall uh, so that they can be informed, know where some of the money is, and let's, as a Black people, get aligned around an agenda that will bring economic justice into our community. And so we have with us tonight Dr. Samuel Talbert, Jr., who is the president of the National Baptist Convention of America. We also have with us Dr. Frederick D. Haynes III, and he is the pastor of the Friendship Baptist Church, the co-chair of the Social Justice Commission for the Progressive National Convention. We have Dr. Willie D. Francois, who is also the co-chair and president of the Black Church Center of Justice. We have Dr. Jacqueline Thompson, who is the senior pastor of Allen Temple Baptist Church in Oakland, California. 
And we have Bishop Talbert Swan, who is the social justice ministry. He's the director of the social justice ministry for the Church of God and Christ. And we have Bishop Joseph Walker III, who is the presiding elder for the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship. And we have Dr. W. Franklin Richardson, who's the pastor of the honored and esteemed Grace Baptist Church. And he is also the chair for the National Action Network and for the Conference of National Black Churches. And we have then Bishop Donald Hilliard, who is the bishop at the Cathedral Church here in the state of New Jersey. So let's give all of these folks a hand uh, for joining us tonight and for being with us tonight. Uh, I do not see Roland. Is Roland here yet? Is Roland here? Okay, so until Roland comes on, we're gonna go ahead and kind of kick this off. So here's the first question. And he and I kind of talk through this that I want to pose for the group tonight. And that is, what is the role of the black church in pursuing economic justice? And I'm gonna start, if you will, with Dr. Franklin Richardson and have Dr. Franklin Richardson to expound upon that. And then we're gonna hear from other individuals that are a part of the panel tonight. Thank you, Dr. Jefferson. Let me say that, that first of all, I think what we have to get our hands around at the, at the church level and at the pew level is that we have to free ourselves from a theology that, in, uh, that, that aids in our economic disempowerment. We, we must, must, we gotta make sure that we, our people understand that it's okay with God for us to have, matter of fact, God, God refer, prefers us to have resources to direct our own destinies, that it is not, that it is not in conflict. God, God is on the side of our economic empowerment. In, in spite of some primitive theologi theological bases that have had social negative sociological impact, that have suggested that that money is uh, what is it the, e the root of e all evil? Uh, it is the root of all evil if we love it, but it is also an empowering resource that has assisted our oppression as African American people. The manipulation of resources has kept us down in terms of educational opportunity, investment opportunity, land ownership, all of the things that make life full in America have been limited by the, by, the, by the withholding of economic resources in our community. So for me, the first step is for us to understand and to have our people understand that God is on the side of our economic empowerment. Thank you, thank you, Donna. Thank you very much. Uh, I, am, I am going to now pose that, that same question to Dr. Frederick Douglas Haynes of the Friendship Church and ask him to also uh, respond to that question as well. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor uh, Jefferson. I thank you for your leadership and I thank you for assembling uh, this panel for this conversation. Of course, I applaud you for your prophetic witness and leadership and I thank God for uh, what God has done through you and continues to do through you. And so thank you for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. I'll just piggyback on uh, what uh, the great Dr. Richardson uh, said, who is a prophet without peer. Uh, and that is we have to develop for me a theology of economic justice. And for me, it's rooted in what Luke chapter four. Well, there in Luke chapter four, Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the spirit has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Stop right there, poor. That word poor in the original language, uh, Bishop Barbara always tells us is a word that means those who've been made poor because of economic exploitation, economic systems of injustice. And so our savior 
in his mission slash vision statement said that a part of my ministry is to engage in preaching good news to those who have been made poor by economic injustice and we have run away from this theology of economic justice. And so we engage in charity, that's good, but that's not economic justice. We may even do economic development, that's good. But the reason you need development and the reason there's a need for charity is there's an absence of justice. There's an absence of economic justice. And so, so for me, it begins with uh, theologizing appropriately. Uh, I think we all know the, the language of who is it? Gil Scott Heron who said the rev revolution will not be televised. I remix it and say the revolution will be theologized because when we get our theology together and have a theology of economic justice, and, and I'll just give it to you real plain, real quick, and I'm done. And that is justice looks like ensuring that there is distribution of resources that is what? Equitable. And so as a consequence, I'm here in the state of Texas and here in Texas, y'all pray for us, less than 2% of all state contracts go to black businesses. I don't care how much charity you give, if you have an economic system where the outcome is less than 2% of all uh, uh, contracts go to black businesses, you're not going to have equity, let alone equality. So we must start thinking in terms of economic justice, which deals with systems that unfortunately are guilty of institutional, institutional inequity and uh, systemic uh, injustice. And so we got to deal with systems. And this is a lot deeper than just giving out a free meal. It's a lot deeper than engaging in quote unquote economic development. All that's good, but we need justice. Amen. Amen. Now, now let me, let me leverage what Dr. Haynes just said. And Sister Jacqueline, I'm going to go to you because we have just had uh, Sister Jennifer uh, Jones Austin republish Dr. Bill Jones' book where he talks about the systems that Dr. Freddie Haynes just spoke about that connect and therefore embellish and hold us in hostage when it comes to economic empowerment. Would, would you comment on that book and how that book can definitely be leveraged in order for our parishioners? to embrace and be empowered when it comes to economic justice? Absolutely, good evening everyone. And thank you, Dr. Jefferson, for having me. I'm honored to be amongst this distinguished panel to have this conversation. Uh, the book you are referencing, God in the Ghetto, that has been re-released by his daughter, Jennifer. Uh, I think it's an important book. It's an important work at this time because what Dr. Jones has done and what he has said is just as relevant today as it was when he wrote it back then. And the reality is he establishes that the wealth inequity that exists in our country today is not just a function of our failure to have a theology. It is also a function of policy. And so we need our people to understand the ways in which poverty is legislated and maintained by the government that we sit under. And so Dr. Jones goes over the history that ghettos are not just a congregation where a bunch of certain people live, but they are actually created by the policies, by the laws, by legislators and legislation that includes redlining, that includes racial covenants, that includes all kinds of things that continue to keep a particular people disenfranchised. And along with that comes all of the other ills that are known to urban communities. I don't know where all of you pastor, but I know in my particular context, which is very urban, we are very, very urban here in Oakland, California. You probably saw us on the news yesterday where they are talking about the increase in homicides in quote unquote ghettos all across this nation in urban centers. It has a lot to do with the lack of economic empowerment that is being felt by the residents of these communities. And so I think the black church has a responsibility, but it's not a new responsibility. Often when we have this conversation, we kind of start where Dr. Martin Luther King ended, right? With his, with his switch to economic empowerment 
empowerment. But in reality, long before the civil rights movement, the black church was always doing everything it could to make sure that black people were sustained financially. We founded banks, we founded universities and colleges, we founded hospitals, we had the Freedmen's Bureau, we set up suffrage organizations to make sure that our people's economic needs were met. So I think it's about time that we kind of pick that mantle up once again, because this is the last frontier for us. The reality is we won't know how our people are really suffering until we come out of this pandemic. But the studies that they've done toward the end of 2020 says that white folks still continue to hold 7.8 times more household wealth than black folks. And what we do know is that that gap is continuing to widen. And so if anyone should be on the forefront of this issue, because it's the people in the pews that are impacted by this reality, it should be the Black church. And that's what God in the ghetto continues to underscore then and even now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let, <laughs> let me cover one item that I failed to cover, and I really apologize. We have our ambassador, Sujay Cook, with us tonight, and she has been doing just a super job. And so I, uh, I, I want to, I, I skipped her and please forgive me for that uh, because she's a dear, dear friend and she's doing a prophetic outstanding job. So I just want to make sure that we do that. We had Bishop Joseph Walker. Bishop Walker has his full gospel conference that is going on. And I believe that Bishop Jakes is preaching close to right now, has already preached. So if Bishop Walker, and I'm going to ask uh, that we would have um, uh, someone reach out and if he could come back just for a few seconds and greet us, I would deeply uh, appreciate that. Uh, Bishop Joseph Walker is very much into this topic and he was trying to balance a couple of things. So we're gonna ask uh, Keon if he would reach out and ask him to come back just for a minute so that he can have some comments. Ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, take this opportunity. We now have a moderator with us uh, Roland Martin, unfiltered. Uh, is he there, Luella? Is, Ro is Roland with us? Yeah, I'm here. There, there he is. Roland. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, you have a lot of background. Hold on. No, I got you. I got you. Okay, there you go. Roland just Roland has been flying across the country, landing in Chicago, just finished the show. And thanks a lot. Uh, Roland has been on this topic uh, 100%. And so Roland, let me uh, <clears throat> ask you to come on board. And while Roland is coming on board, let's see if we can get Bishop Walker back on uh, right quick. Like, Roland, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Then, then we're gonna we're gonna have Roland uh, kind of leverage this uh, from here, and he and I go back and forth tonight. So uh, let's let's roll it, Roland. All right, glad to have uh, everyone here. I'm actually at the uh, Bureau and Bar Restaurant in Chicago, and just nearly finished on the show. Uh, so glad to have everyone uh, who is here. This is all about folks guys, uh, uh, dealing with a fundamental issue that impacts us economics, dealing with getting our fair share. This is not about us talking about philanthropy. We're not you interested got, in- We got some major feedback. We got some major okay, hold on. Uh, all right, so let me do this here. I'm actually, I'm wearing a earbud uh, so I can be able to hear you guys. Uh, so I'm going to move. Yeah, that's the thing. If Roland mute, Roland, why don't you mute? mute. And while Roland is muted, I'm just going to step, step outside for a second. To Francois, uh, Dr. Francois, where is Francois? Yes, sir. I, I I know that in Atlantic City, and in several places, you are focused on economic transformation. And what I'd like to ask is, how do you see the Black Church energizing <clears throat> and empowering the pew? so that we get our people engaged in understanding this issue and therefore have them to also support what is taking place. 
Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Jefferson, for, for curating this and, and, and for inviting me to this experience. I think one thing that, that has to really be at the center of mobilizing and energizing Black, Black faith communities around economic justice is this sort of reclamation of a history uh, that Dr. Thompson has, has presented to us, uh, that, that she, she offered to us, is, is reclamation of a history that the actual womb of of the black economy right after black people were no longer property uh, was the black church. It, it, is, it is the black church that gives birth to these businesses, gives birth to hospitals, give birth to, uh, give birth to our schools, right? I, I talk about this as, as a kind of reconstruction ecclesiology. How do we reclaim the kind of economic vision uh, that was radical in the 1800s that would still actually be radical today if we if we were able to make that link between the development of a black economy that comes from black lay folk and black le and black church leaders but also it's important to to note that the proposals, the earliest proposals around reparations come from ministers. And so there is, there's a, there's a reconstruction ecclesiology. There, there's a way that we think about those 12 years that were contested, but those 12 years where we saw boom, uh, uh, you know, are the beginning of any kind of black mass black ownership or, or semblance of mass black ownership. It is, it is situating who we are as black faith folk in that particular history. I think another thing that, that is really important is, is that there, and, and Dr. Haynes sort so of spoke to this, is that our theological diets, our, our, our Bible study diets have to be laced with justice social content. Is that it's really, it's really impossible to believe that we can mobilize folk in the pew uh, sort of on one-offs uh, situationally when we've not cre when we've not uh, developed ministries that have social justice in its DNA uh, mm -hmm. and so there has to be ways that we talk seriously about the Bible itself is written in six eras or six periods of oppression. That the Bible itself is a document that is produced underneath a great economic exploitation. And sometimes it outlines economic exploitation, even when it's biblical Israel itself uh, doing that particular work. And so it's, it is how do we craft a diet uh, that is theological, a diet uh, of biblical literacy uh, that is not the kind of biblical illiteracy that we call biblical literal literalism uh, that we often get from the right, but a real kind of biblical literacy that understands that Jesus talks more about economic justice than he talks about any single issue, and that the Old Testament talks about economic justice more than it talks about any single issue. And so it's grounding, uh, creating a, a theological appetite for, uh, for justice work. And then it has to, it I think it also requires, and, and these are broad strokes, but it also requires our denominations, our local uh, uh, ministry groups to actually have some kind of Black legislative agenda. How do we come together and figure out what kinds of issues are we willing to get behind, right? Because uh, in a lot of ways, we think that economics is really only about jobs. And what we find out is that this country has created a lot of jobs and it has not done a significant, has not had a significant impact on black wealth, right? We even think about this. We've passed the Voting Rights Act, which is now gutted. We know that. We've passed a Civil Rights Act. Uh, we have passed a Fair Housing Act. And neither of those have done the work of bridging this gap in our in our wage in, in this wealth gap that, that we experience uh, in this country. Why? Because we know that what's really wrong is that there were 246 years of unpaid slave labor that no amount of mass savings, no amount of investments, no amount of job creation, no amount of $15 minimum wage are really going to bridge. So we have to have the structural conversation around what does a real policy agenda that is reparative actually look like. And, and, uh, and we, but I, but I, but I, so let me ask this. Reparation. So let me, let me just, let, let me, me ask this. Go ahead, go ahead. So, so, so let me do one thing here. 
And that is <clears throat> what Francois just walked through is something that is very important. And Roland and I talk about this a lot. And that is we have to kind of get some of this out of the pulpit <laughs> and understand the data and get the facts and get the information. One of the things that the black church is not short of is an outstanding prophetic voice. And there's no question about the fact that you will walk not into any pulpit in the world and obtain the inspiration, the motivation, et cetera, that you're gonna get from the black church. Here's the deal. The deal is we now have to do the work to understand where the money is, to understand what percent of the contracts, to know what is going where, and then educate individuals on that so that they will be armed to fight. And that's one of the biggest gaps and one of the biggest issues that we have. And that is what, right. percent, then, what percent then of the media stuff that they spend that are going to like media companies? What percent of pension funds, what percent of pension funds are going to African-American asset managers? In the state of New Jersey, we have 20 percent of the pension funds are represented from African American employees. And I need everybody to kind of hear this, so mute for me just a second. We have in this state, in New Jersey, in the last 15 years, we have not had one investment manager nor officer that is making decisions that's black when it comes to the pension fund. We have an $80 billion pension fund and we have less than maybe 3% of all of that money being managed by African-American asset managers. Now folks, the truth of the matter is, is that that money is going to major Wall Street, right, quote, business, I mean, uh, asset management companies. They're taking that money and they're therefore putting it with huge development companies who come into our communities and build stuff that we can't afford. And we are therefore funding the gentrification of our own community. We are taking Aunt Sally, grandma money that they had in the pension fund and we're dealing with it somewhere else. And so as a result of that, one of the things that we have to do is ensure the fact that we are understanding the data that we know where the money is going, that we follow the money and make sure that we get our fair share of that money. Now, I know that, you know, we have Dr. Talbert with us tonight. And one of the things that he has done is really kind of worked on trying to get the data, trying to get the numbers. And, and I would appreciate it if Dr. Talbert would kind of comment on what he's doing, some of the stuff that's going on, because folks, we have to understand the data. We have to understand the numbers. We have to follow the money trail. And I wanna encourage everybody tonight to ask these questions of your black elected officials. Phil Murphy got 94% of the African-American vote in the state of New Jersey. Let me repeat, that is unheard of. He ran on an agenda of economic fairness we have yet to have a disparity study done. We have yet to really see any significant movement in terms of pension fund stuff and other things. And I would say to all of my New Jersey colleagues and all of our friends, if we are not gonna have Phil Murphy have our backs, then why should we have Phil Murphy back? One of the things that Biden said when he won, he said for years, black folks have had my back. Now I'm gonna have your back. I think that Phil Murphy need to take a page from Joe Biden's playbook and black folks need to therefore hold our elected officials accountable and make sure we make this quote an election issue. Now, Dr. Talbert, I'm gonna to go to you and then we're gonna to go uh, to you, Sujay, and then we're gonna turn this to Roland because we really do need to provide folks with some information tonight and make sure that when we leave this town hall, there is a line of, I would say some alignment 
And Francois, you're right. We need a common agenda that cuts across conventions, cuts across association, cuts across churches, align the Black Caucus in Washington with us and get all of us on the same page. If we wake up the pew in the Black church, we can do anything, folks, in terms of getting economic justice to our people and lift them out of poverty. Dr. Talbert, uh, will you kind of comment in terms of where you are and what you're doing? Is he on? He's muted. Hello. While we're getting him on, uh, how is this audio sound? I want to double check your audio. You want to turn down a little bit? How is this audio sound? Can you hear me? Uh, we can, but we, you got feedback rolling. Mm, not sure why. Yeah, mm. So, Jay, while he's trying to clear that up, will you please kind of pick sure. that up? Yeah, I think that's every thank you again for the invitation to be here and thank you to partner together for alignment. Um, I think, you know, as we talk about all of the ecclesiastical theologies of economics, I think we also have to make sure that we include not just economic justice, but gender justice with that, because the fastest growing businesses in America are black women owned businesses. And we cannot leave that out, even though there's still not the same amount of access to capital resources as other businesses but it still cannot be negated. So I'm a third generation black woman business owner. And so my ministry really now is wealth and wellness for our communities because our communities can't be well if there's the lack of wealth or as a, one preacher calls it, poor wealth or low wealth. And so I think we have to look at what's happening in America in terms of black women um, owning businesses rapidly. 763 businesses are started each day by black women. And so we have formed what's called the Global Black Women's Chamber of Commerce. And it's the only chamber of commerce in the world that focuses solely on black women owned businesses. And so we have accumulated data. We've had two state of black women summits, virtual summits during COVID with over 2000 women. And we're finding that black women want to own businesses because the three ways to wealth for our people are home ownership, land ownership, and business ownership. And so we have to not only develop economic development corporations within our churches, but we also have to make sure that the dollar circulates within our churches, which is how my family's business grew. Now the longest running black family owned business in New York City is in its 59th year, but it started in a church um, in Harlem Union Baptist Church and our churches supported each other and church lay and pew supported each other. And I think that's what we're talking about tonight. If we're talking about the lining, we have to circulate that dialogue just like other ethnic groups do within our communities. That's the beginning of uh, building wealth for us. So let's establish, so um, if we establish something here that I think is important. And this is regardless if you are a black man or a black woman. Pre-COVID, there were 2.6 million black-owned businesses in America. 2.5 million had one employee. Of those 2.6 million black-owned businesses, they get average revenue of $54,000. So it doesn't matter if you're a black woman or a black man. Truth be told, and I'm being very clear, when we talk about the numbers of black women who are starting businesses, I can't focus on that. Here's why. And let me explain that, folks. A lot of us are starting businesses, but truth be told, they're not actual businesses. They are sole proprietorships. And so what we have to be dealing with is the fact that the billions being spent right now, and I've said this many times, and this is where folks uh, who talk about reparations, this is where, um, where we differ. I'm, this, I'm not waiting for Congress to pass H.R. 40, when right now Congress is spending half a trillion dollars a year and we're getting 1%. So what this conversation is about, and what we're trying to get pastors in New Jersey to focus on, just in New Jersey, is that right now, billions of dollars of your taxpayer money is being spent in New Jersey to make white people wealthy. So what has to happen right now is we cannot have general conversations about money. We can't have general conversations. It has to be, 
how much money is being spent specifically, as Pastor Jefferson said, pension funds. How much money is being spent in housing? How much money this trillion dollar deal that was cut in Congress, how much is going to be spent on, on, on transportation in the state? Who are getting the contracts? Who are getting the catering contracts? The limousine contracts? Every single agency in, 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 um, in New Jersey, and not just New Jersey, the state universities, what are they spending and who are they spending their money with? Uh, the major hospitals, nonprofits as well. So what is there's a pool of money sitting out there right now. We have to be talking about how that we are building capacity among Black-owned businesses because truth be told, it means nothing. We, we went, just to give this last data point, this is why the data matters. Seven years ago, we had 1.9 million Black-owned businesses. 1.8 million had one employee now. They were doing average revenue of $110,000. So what I just said, in seven years, we have increased, this is pre-COVID, in seven years, we increased by 700,000, the number of Black-owned businesses, but the revenue got cut in half. So that's why we can't talk about, oh, this is our, uh, it was starting businesses. Means nothing if the revenue is getting cut in half and they're only being able to pay themselves, they can't pay anybody else. And so what we have to be locked and loaded on, and if, uh, if uh, Samuel Tobert is there, we need to know specifically, because we, be, we can't be going to the governor of New Jersey, the state legislators, and saying, we got to get our fair share if we're not being specific, saying, right now, you're spending 0.8% with Black-owned companies. You're spending 1%. So the data is important and we have to empower the members with that data so they then can be specific in asking questions. So when they say, oh, sure, I believe it's important for us to assist black owned businesses, it's like, yeah, but you're not. And you haven't done it. And then here are the numbers. And so that's why that information is important for us to the grow. So I'm gonna throw this out and I would love to hear if Pastor Richardson or anyone else can answer this. First, have any of you done surveys and audits First of all, to know specifically the Black-owned businesses that are in your congregations. Two, of those Black-owned businesses, how many of them have tried to get contracts with the state, county, or city? Three, what were the barriers to do so? Because having that data is also important. If anybody could actually speak to that, that's critically important because you got to have a starting point for us to be able to move forward. So who, who wants to sort of uh, answer? Let me, let me, let me take that, uh, Roland. Um, yeah, we, we've done a survey in terms of Black-owned businesses in our church. We're doing one now uh, in our denomination. I think one of the critical problems when it comes to barriers... Now, now, hold on, Bishop. Is it by category? Uh, so we, is, are you breaking it out by... These are all the categories they're in as well. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Got it. Got it. Now, now one of the critical barriers we have uh, particularly here uh, in the state that I live in, are the ways that these quote unquote set asides are set up. The, the, we have what, what's called Samba certification for minority businesses. And what we found out is because of the way they categorize um, classes of folk, white women qualify as a minority business. So what wealthy white men have done is they have set up their wife as being 51% owner, themselves being 49% owner, qualifying as a Samba certified business, and then going after contracts that are particularly set aside for minority businesses. That is problematic. Um, one of the things right. we all understand. So, so I gotta ask you this, Bishop. I just yeah. want you to put the to hold that right there. I gotta mm -hmm. ask you this now. So when, when y'all are raising those issues, because this happened to John McAfee here in Chicago, this happened to Illinois at Salem Baptist Church. They presented to the Black Caucus, they said, here are the women numbers, here are the Black, the Hispanic, the Asian, the American. And they had the Black media who was invited. I said, if you're a Black woman, which one of them categories you in? They said, but you're in the Black. I said, well, you're a Latino woman, where, where you at? They said, you're Latino. I said, so basically, that W should be WW for white women. So mm -hmm. what we have done is, we have separated that. What we've said is, don't come to us. This we've done with the thing about Al and the advertising. We said, don't come talking to us about MWBE. Don't come talking to us about the birth. We want to know black owned 
So don't Absolutely. come with that big that big number. So that's 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 another one of the things that Absolutely. I get away. And and that and that's critical. They built MGM came here and built a billion dollar casino. And I know how what we some may feel about um, legalized gaming. They were going to build it. So we said, listen, there's got to be a specific amount of jobs that go to black people. We're not talking about minorities. We're not talking about lumping us all in a class um, and then trying to get your numbers that way. I think one of the other things that we've got to do as the church is to be the first partaker. We've got to be the first example. The black church, we can't hire everybody that's been victimized by systemic racism, but we can contribute to structural change. Um, we can make sure that when we do hire in our own practices, um, you know, what Jesus preached and proclaimed, uh, the good news for the poor, as Dr. Haynes uh, said, we've got to make sure that we're paying a living wage, that we're not leaning on, you know, uh, 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 do it for charity, do it as unto the Lord. Um, and we got to make sure that we that we're paying people um, a livable wage, whether they are guest speakers, clinicians, trade workers, everybody should be adequately compensated for their work. We can't contribute to the exploitation of black labor and the infrastructure of poverty with some callous appeals to Christian charity if we are going to be the voice that is going to be calling for economic justice. So the thing, so so here's what also we're getting at. Now this is why it's important. So I'm gonna go back to that question that the Bishop uh, Talbert answered. Why the survey matters? Because you need to be able to know what is existing inside of your own church in terms of how many actual people own businesses in your church. Then they got it. Then this is where I think as pastors, you have to encourage them and everybody get all, I don't want to let nobody know how much business I'm doing. So the bottom line is this here. We can't say, well, this is what we did last year. And then we come back a year later and say, how do we do? And we don't actually track the numbers. So we got to be able to encourage that as well. The, and, the, and then the third piece is, and I, I, I thought about this, whether you want to call it public hearings or whatever, but it's also important, I believe, for the churches to set up uh, some system where you're, where you're not, where, where you're getting information from them. So you need to understand what are the roadblocks that you're going through. So let me just, just give you an example. Coca-Cola. When I had conversations with them, I said, let me explain to y'all how the white ad agencies block us. And this is what they do. This is this is the game that they play. I said, and look, y'all don't realize this. You're pro, you think that's your ad agency? I said, no, this is how they do it. Well, what happened was we cut a deal where they folks said, Roland, we're doing this deal with you. Then the agency basically tried to come back and bet me again and block the deal. They saw in real time how the agencies manipulate the process. So you need to be getting information from your members on how they have gone through these contract processes and the games that have been played. So you're now armed with the data because I can guarantee you someone who's covered politician. They don't know, they don't know the bureaucracy. They pass the laws, they don't understand the bureaucracy. And so we have to have that as well. We are actually communicating. If anyone else, I mean, I want to know what specifically are you doing? How are you gathering information, data in your churches before you go outside of what we're talking about here? Let's go to let's go to uh, uh, Dr. Talbert. Um, I know he was trying to come off a few minutes ago. Uh, Dr. Talbert, you there? Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jefferson and. It's an honor to be on with this panel. Um, as I spoke to you uh, earlier, one of the things that I believe is important, and I know uh, Mr. Martin has, has posed a question and I'm kind of going another direction a little bit, but as the president of National Baptist, a uh, leader of a denomination uh, that I've been doing now for six years, one thing I, I discovered early on, and we've been trying to correct it, uh, and that is for too long the conventions have waited on the churches to serve them. And I think we need to flip the script. And I've been working as a president to discover how can the convention serve the congregation? And going back to what Mr. Martin said, that's one of the ways 
that we can teach them the proper way to do the surveys. Because there may be some of the churches doing surveys, but if you're not doing it correctly, you still end up not being able to help lift your people. And so I believe that not only do uh, we need to do it as a single denomination, and, and I don't take anything away from one denomination or one church because I believe they can be impactful. But the reason I'm on here tonight is because I don't want to solo this. I believe our group needs to join with Bishop Walker and, and Bishop uh, Swan and other groups uh, and, and come up with some uniform way that we're going to start addressing economic um, uh, and, and, and social justice issues together. And I think, uh, Dr. Jefferson, you're calling us together is important. Tonight, I'm impressed with the fact that I've heard us talk about an issue uh, in New Jersey. If we can home in as conventions, put our forces and our numbers together, because sometimes we're shooting all over the nation and we're not getting anything done. If we could home in on that situation of those Blacks in New Jersey who are not allowed to deal with these pension funds, and we've got Blacks that are qualified, some of them are working for the white companies that are getting the business in New Jersey. If all of us can come together and create a template and succeed in New Jersey, then we can replicate this in the state where I live, like Louisiana or Texas or any state. And I think that's the role of our convention. We can no longer just be big worship. We've got to do big work. Wow. And we need to do that big work together, not in a silo by ourselves. Hey, Roland, let, let me, me let, let me bro, let me let me just do something yeah. here because what, what 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 he just said is is absolutely on the money. I know we had some disjointed stuff up front in terms of getting this together, but we're engaging right now in the real meat of what has to happen to crack the code on this. And what, what Dr. Tabo was basically referring to is the notion that we have here in New Jersey. Blueprint Capital has really become here in New Jersey the poster child of how black businesses are treated in this state. And let me just provide five key things in terms of where this case is. They had the courage that they, they really through prayer brought a suit against the state because they were discriminated against with respect to them having their fair share of the pension fund. They are the only African-American asset management firm in the history of the state of New Jersey. And the governor was well aware of the mistreatment of this particular firm and did nothing. The firm was forced to sue the state. The state has retaliated and threatened to put Blueprint out of business. Blueprint has survived and the state is trying to block information from being released. And the state is engaged in a cover up and the legal folks for Blueprint is about to call for an investigation of the pension fund for the state of New Jersey from the Department of Justice. And I would submit to everybody tonight that is listening to this, you perhaps have the same thing that is going on with this huge amount of money in your state. And, and I could not respect Dr. Talbert more. If a win in New Jersey will be a win for everybody in this country. And it is important for us to know, Roland, to your point, that these folks did their homework and understand what percent of that pension money, quote, are Black folks putting in there? They know that. What percent is coming to the Black community? They know that. What percent then is being managed by black, black folks? They know that. And I wanted to just leverage that point because, you know, Dr. Tobert made a great point. And if we can get alignment and support and let the folks here, especially this governor, know that we're not going to take this and we have the support of other people, folks, listen to me. We can absolutely crack this code. Now, now, so, now so, so let, me, let me use some numbers. I, 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 and the reason this is important, I'm going to go back to the numbers. If we're able to say 100 billion, let's just say 100 billion, 100 billion dollars is being spent in New Jersey every single year. I'm just putting that number out. Let's say it's 1% going to black 
own entities. Now what we're able to say is the number needs to be 518. It needs to be 1215. Now all of a sudden we're establishing markers. I'm gonna pull in uh, uh, Reverend Richardson here on, on this point here. Because by doing that, now you can now force folks to actually have a commitment. So when we went out to the advertising agencies, when we said, y'all spending less than one, double it to two, then, then that's what Byron said. Then we came in and said, no, damn, that is five. They were all like, oh. So what happened was we started setting a floor. Well, if you were spending 1% of $300 billion every year, and now we're going to move to 5%, that means that in one year, we can make what's going to take us five years to actually make. That's why we got to be dealing in terms of, and, 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 be, and we have to understand, there's two things we got to do. We cannot get seduced by two things. Do not get seduced by a percentage and don't get seduced by a number. So New Jersey says, and again, I'm just throwing out, but New Jersey says, sure, okay, we'll do 2%. But the next question is 2% of what? What's the 2% of? You see, if they say, okay, well, we'll we're going to take it up to 5 billion. Okay, 5 billion of what? <laughs> see, so we, so we, so the demand in New Jersey has to be, we want to know the percentage and the number. So we're matching up because if the total spend is 100 billion and they say, well, we're going to spend five, you say, wait a minute, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, 10% of 100 billion ain't 5 billion. And so that's the sort of, that's sort of the game that they actually play. And, and what it then does is, folks, oh, it, completely, it completely alters the game. It builds capacity. Then we can grow to do all those different things. And so that that's the strategy that has to be behind um, uh, making the demands of the governor and the legislators. And the reason New Jersey is so important, it's an extremely blue state. Yeah. So we can we can wield the black vote of, yeah. and use it against them. That's why this is not like this split is a red state. No, no, no. This is where we can shame them. I say, hold up. Of all people, this is a democratic state. How dare you not spend the numbers? And so that's why the black population in New Jersey's matter. If you're looking at how much they're currently spending is critically important. That's the only way this is going to change. We got to have those very specific numbers and specific ask in doing it. And Bishop Bishop Hilliard, uh, way, way in, because to Roland's point, we have a majority in the Senate in the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. We have a majority in the Assembly in the state of New Jersey. And we have a Democratic governor. There's no reason why. Black folks have to beg for anything in the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. That's right. That there's no reason why we have to plead for anything in the state of New Jersey, folks. Right. I mean, we have a majority everywhere. Right. Right. And, and, and I think it's absolutely essential that we show strength and not weakness. Right. And, and Bishop, you are in the center of the state. You've been engaged in this. And I'd like for you to jump in and share your position on this kind of thing. I want to thank you again for uh, inviting us to this forum. Thank you for this invitation and for the fine work that you're doing uh, in Newark. I will celebrate 38 years of pastoring the historic Second Baptist Church, known as the Cathedral International, uh, this October. Um, as everybody was speaking and using this wonderful uh, words and giving such dropping major knowledge, I heard the old deacon on the front row saying, make it plain, preacher make it plain. And I think that I think that that's what has to happen as I listen to each person speaking. Um, the, the, what we're saying now must be broken down into bite-sized nuggets so right. that the people in the pew, they cannot be empowered if they're not engaged in the conversation. So when I talk about we need to have economic empowerment revivals, social justice uh, symposiums, um, uh, uh, labor, uh, uh, black labor, black work uh, lecture series, and then we need we need we need booklets and pamphlets and things to disseminate out among the people 
And then we must put it in our language, our preaching language, our prayer language, our revival language. What comes to my mind is the third chapter of the Acts of the Apostles where Peter and John are on their way to the temple to pray. And there's a lame beggar on the steps of the church. And the scripture says he locked eyes with them expecting to receive something. And the people on the, on the steps of our churches and the people in the pews are still locking eyes with us and they're expecting to receive something. And I mean, they're expecting to receive hope. In the midst of all of this, we've got to have still a theology of hope, a theology of can do, because our people have done. We endured and overcame black code, overcame and lived through Jim Crow. And even in the midst of all of this, we've got to break it down, make it plain, you got to stay with these forums and break these forums down even on a lay level way and so that the people can literally touch the essence of what it is we're trying to help them learn how to get empowered themselves. They cannot become empowered if they do not understand the depth of the conversation. And I, finally, Dr. Proctor, uh, Sujay, and my uh, mentor there at United Seminary, Dr. Proctor said, the church remains the last vestige of hope and deliverance for black people. If the church blows this moment, our people will not be delivered and they will not be free and they will not be liberated. We still have the answer. And the answer is that Christ is concerned about the lame beggar, concerned about injustice, concerned about economic injustice, concerned about social injustice. And he's also, let me just say this, we have to also keep a hand on too in the church who's doing well and pull them into the, everybody's not broke. Everybody's not, you know, suffering. Everybody's not struggling through public school. You know, there are folk in our congregations that are doing very well and have done very well during the pandemic. Jesus is also concerned about the wealthy. He's concerned about the poor and the down and out, but he is also concerned about the wealthy. And we've got to tap those people, too, and bring them into the forum and together uplift and liberate in the name oh, of the Lord. Amen. Hey, 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 Dr. Richardson, Dr. Richardson, let, let's let's one of the things that we have to deal with. And thank God you have served well in numerous capacities. Is this notion of the relevancy of the church unless we can relate to young people? around the notion of what kind of future, what kind of career, what quote are things looking like for them? And, <laughs> and, and I, I, would, I would love for you to address that because let's face it, if our churches are declining and we're not seeing uh, a number of young adults that we need to empower in our churches because they are wondering how they're going to make it. And this right here happened to be an issue that they are very much concerned about. So if you connect the data, you know, they're drinking the Cokes or they're buying the cars, rolling, you know what I'm talking about. You know, the media is going, they need to know that GM is not putting X amount of money into media. They need to know that, hey, the pension fund is not being managed by African-American managers. If they don't get answers to that, they will be turned off and wonder, y'all preaching, you know, the Red Sea and Daniel in the lion's den. But when I leave here, I'm trying to make ends meet. I'm trying to pay that college bill. I, I, I don't have a job commensurate with my ability to be able to pay that loan back. Dr. Rishan, can you kind of speak to that with respect to how we move from where we are to interest them in the topic that we're into tonight? The great challenge of the church is relevance. That's the great challenge of the black church. And the, the degree to which we are a relevant institution to all segments of our community will, de will determine our appeal and our ability to attract. As long as we are not engaged in the things that people, that makes difference in people's lives, we will see a diminishing of membership and a diminishing of impact in our churches. We've got to come to a new level of relevance and engagement. We cannot continue to go the route that we have been going. It's clear to me that the church has an opportunity too often we are celebrating where we've been and not being honest with where we are right now. 
we had great history. Yeah. But 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 that's not where we are now. Our churches are diminishing. Some of our churches are co-conspirators to racism. Hmm. Some of our churches have sold out to white Jesus. And therefore, our young people are more informed than they've ever been. And they read what, what's going on. So therefore, we got to move from conversations, even how relevant these conversations are, to engagement and to activities. And I'm, I'm excited about what you're doing, uh, Jefferson, in New Jersey. I think we ought to just go ahead and make Jer Jersey our pilot for launching an economic church agenda in the United States. It's prime. It's, it's never been a time when you got such great numbers. A Senate majority, a House majority, a 94% black turnout for the governor, and, 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 and you got these inequities of, of distribution of resources. This is a wonderful pilot for us to make work and then carry it across the country. We ought to all be joining in on New Jersey and mm -hmm. bringing the attention. We need a major, we need a major communications, and rolling so powerful with that, putting marketing materials in. We need to flood New Jersey. We need a major march on the governor that is not just Jersey focused. That is bringing the whole uh, attention to. I think. I think we got to. We got to get action. We cannot long. We cannot. The, the the part of the journey is conversations, but the the destination is action that makes a difference. There are statistics. Roland already got. Roland already has statistics that we could use to help our our people understand. We don't need to be too abstract. Just solidly. You your money. For pensions is now being paid to the white people and they helping put put you out your community. They gentrify your community. Just simple, quick statement that catch, catches people's attention. I think that's what we gotta do. I think we got an opportunity with you, uh, Jeff, in New Jersey. I, I really do. And I think we all, and it's right on the verge of New York. You know, in the National Action Network, we've been fighting this uh, pension plan fight for a long time. We have, there are over 60 uh, billionaire a billion dollar pension funds and investment agencies in New York, black. And they outperform and rolling the, outperform the white entities. We, we, we are ready for this fight, but somebody got to declare it. Okay, can I, can I ask a question, Dr. Uh, Jefferson, just a quick question. And this goes back to Dr. Uh, Tolbert's point. Um, right now, the full gospel um, is, is in their conference. We're going back to our conference after having a year off last year. In our typical convocation, every November, we pump 60 to $70 million into the economy in St. Louis and now back in Memphis. Um, I'm wondering how much money the National Baptist, the Progressive Baptist, the Full Gospel, um, pump into economies uh, with their various conferences. Now, if Black businesses need our support, if Black churches and denominations committed to contracting with black businesses, especially within their local communities. What type of an economic model would that generate? What type of wealth would that generate in our community? Because the church uh, has to be at the forefront of those advocacy efforts for fair contracting with our uh, businesses from a governmental perspective, but we've got to be the example of it on the denominational and the local level. We can't participate in spending all of our money with white businesses uh, and then be the ones blowing the horn saying uh, we're not let, let, black. Let, let, let me take, let, a, let me, let me take a bite of this response because let me tell you, uh, that is important. That is very important. And we've, we've been talking about that in the black, black denominations for the last 30 years. We've been talking about. But let me say this, the problem we face as black people is a billion dollar problem. It's billions of dollars. 95, that's what we, our problem is a billion dollar problem. So it's not a million dollar problem. And as long as they continue to get all of the billions wrapped out of our community and we gonna deal with millions, we gonna always be behind the, behind the egg bowl. We need to do what you said, but we also need to be focusing on, it's billions of dollars that we need to be trying to get our people's hands around and not millions of dollars. I was trying to answer your question initially, and, and all of this is important. It's just now trillions of dollars, Dr. Richardson, which is right. a 
so important as well. So I think you asked a question about young people. They may not, you know, be on the Daniel and the Lions Den, but millennials are buying and selling businesses. And it goes to Bishop Hilliard's point in terms of let's also celebrate some of the wealth that's in our communities and we learn from some of them. So I think what's important, these forums are excellent, but also what's important are the takeaways from this. What do we do in between the now and the next one? And millennials can be a great voice in terms of teaching us because the revolution won't be televised, but it's going to be digitized. And they know and they get their analytics from this social media and they have numbers and they're selling businesses by the hundreds of thousands. So I think we need to include some in this conversation. I know uh, Willie Francois is one of those young ones, but we need to include their voices in this conversation as well. Well said. I, 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 want, I, want, us, I, I want us to do something here in that all of the points that they made about economics, all of those are mad. All of those absolutely matter. But I want us to be to have narrow casting here. We have to be narrow casting. This this has this has to be the strategy because again, we're going after what really is the largest pool of money. What, what this initiative is about, this is not, it's not called social justice for a reason. It's called black economic social justice. America has treated black folks with philanthropy and aid and not investment. We're not interested, all of those announcements after George Floyd's death, oh, we're gonna give this to this group of Black Lives Matter. If a company gives $5 million to the NAACP and $5 million to Black Lives Matter, that's $10 million. But then they over here, they're spending $5 billion. Yes, that's right. If, there you if go. We got, if, if we got 10, if we got 5% of the 10 billion, what mm -hmm. is that number? <laughs> and that, that dwarfs. So the argument that I'm making is, if we get the 5% of the 10 billion, we can buy our own dog on table at the NAACP banquet. We don't need y'all to buy. So, what this strategy is about is very narrow, and that is, this is the amount of money the state of New Jersey is spending right. every year, and what we're arguing for is our fair share for Black-owned businesses, Yes, which now means that this is where we've got to get from a legislative standpoint, or the other people who do the research, Exactly. What is the what is the amount we spent from this agency, this agency, this agency? Uh, Blueprint's lawsuit provides us the data on the pension fund. Right. So, the, so the market for us right now is to, where we should be trying to get the first win is New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy That's in right. this lawsuit. That's right. That's and, right. This, and because here's the piece. Here's the piece, and this is where we gotta use the power of the church. The pension fund and the average and the, the average person don't understand this. The pension fund money is money of the pension of the public workers. Yeah. Right, so right, every yeah. black person who works for the city, the county, the state, the federal government, the school board, whatever, if you're a public worker, that's your money. So they are taking the pension funds of a significant number of black people and becoming billionaires off of it. So the argument that we can make is already in our favor. I don't know what the number is. Let's say 40% of all public workers in New Jersey are black. That means that we represent 40% of the pension fund. If the pension fund is $80 billion uh, in New Jersey, that means the black portion alone of that is 32 billion of the 80 billion. So the black portion is 32 billion of the 80 billion based upon the 40%. Well, then that means that uh, if y'all only spending half a percent, how you spend that half a percent when we represent 40% of the pension workers? That's right. They can't win that argument. So we got to also achieve wins. So the first thing is applying the pressure to say, we want fair share when it comes to the pension funds and put pressure on the government and the legislature to get that win. Then the next one is, this agency, how much is being spent in the Department of Transportation in New Jersey? Right. How much is being spent in this department, this department, this department? Now all of a sudden, then you have two, three, and four, and five. This is about extracting so to the point that Bishop Swan then brought up, 
yes, when we are now, when we're talking about how do you, you know, black PR firms, black event firms, black catering firms, black transportation companies, because we've actually utilized the state contracts to build their capacity, now they can actually hire more people and grow the businesses. And so the strategy of this New Jersey Black Economic Justice Coalition is to target the state funds that are taxpayer dollars that are not being returned to black people in the form of contracts. That's what the that's that's what the strategy is. And roll it, roll it. And, Let and, me, the, uh, and this is every country. I'm sorry. And there's something here too. Francois, you you are down in that Atlantic City area. And you know, I know a lot about what's going on in Atlantic City. And, and you have a situation there that is connected to the everything that's going on in Jersey that is absolutely pathetic, embarrassing, and insulting. And this is one of the reasons we need to focus on Jersey for transformation and make sure that we have a target. I mean, we are surgical. We need to be very surgical as we come at this holy at this thing and really pursue it. And 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 I need you, why don't you talk about that situation? and how this right here will also help bring deliverance in that community that you're serving in uh, down in Atlantic City. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Dr. Jefferson. I, I think that you know, the, the issue that, that we're focusing on is, is, is so important and it's, 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 a, it's another symptom of, of the exploitation of black labor and the exploitation of Native American lands that is New Jersey, right? And so I think it's always important to place th this important issue that, that you are talking about alongside all the other sins of New Jersey when it comes to economic exploitation. I mean, it, it goes without saying that I live in one of the most economically depressed parts uh, of our state where the majority of people who live in our area don't own business, they, they don't even think to own own business because there has been by state by state mandate and by state policy Atlantic City Atlantic County is almost only a single industry town where all of the jobs have to be casino jobs all of the jobs are hospitality jobs and what we found out is as goes the casinos, so goes the rest of uh, rest of our county. And we we know uh, and during Jim COVID, uh, because we know that that COVID has had uh, its own racialized effects. That Atlantic County lost more percentages of a of, of greater percentage of, of jobs than any county in the country. We lost thirty seven percent of our jobs, uh, more than seventy percent of those being casino jobs, right? Uh, and so this conversation around whether where do state dollars go to build black uh, capacity for, bu for business is important uh, because so many of us are being, our labor is being exploited in industries like the casino industry that are feeding the 1% and trapping us at the bottom, that we have billionaires who are becoming, we, we've, we've seen this, that during, during the pandemic, during Jim COVID, we found out that billionaires have increased their wealth by 55% in 13 months. Like, at, so, at, in places like, like Atlantic City, where we, are, where we are putting alongside this issue uh, that, 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 that we are focusing on today and raising the question that segregation of our schools is a producer of poverty. Uh, and that is the biggest issue that we're fighting right now in Atlantic County, and that's school segregation. And, and, and um, let me just and let me just give but, a stat. But, but Willie, but, 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 but Willie, I gotta get it. But but but, but, but Willie, you, you Willie, you just said something that I, I can't let it go by because I, I need us I need us not to get trapped. Okay, this because you talked about the jobs from the casino. So this is the trap that I need us to be fall for. And I'm gonna go back to being in Chicago and I sat in the room, I literally witnessed it with my own eyes. There were black state legislators who were demanding these 100 apprenticeship jobs. They were like $10 an hour. And I'm sitting, I'm literally sitting in the room and I'm watching this go by. And they they kept going off by 100 apprenticeship jobs, $10 an hour. But it was a $190 million expansion. And I sat there and I'm like, Y'all, they argued, fought for an hour about 100 apprenticeship jobs and spent 10 minutes 
on the 190 million. So when we're talking about what this is all about, this is, listen to everybody in here. This is not a jobs conversation. This is a contracts conversation. Okay. Okay. Because if we, okay. if we get the contracts, we can hire our own people because our businesses will grow. So I want everybody, don't get seduced by the jobs. We're talking about contracts. Yeah. And, and That's Roland, important. Roland, also being prepared for the contracts. We had last night a session with a woman who gets Department of Defense contracts all the time. But just the signing up in terms of trying to get your SAM and your, all your codes and all those things, most of our people don't even know about that to get to the table. It's not whether you're an MWBE. So again, the forms that we need to have in between are about contracts and, and setting up gov contracts uh, committees within our churches that will teach our people how to actually only uh, to win the bid and to apply for the bid. That's a really, really important piece of this. But, but I, and I, I think the jobs, I mean, it, it, is, it is not a jobs conversation, but the jobs component is important that it exaggerates this, that the fact that so many folk who live in our area, their labor is being exploited by the billionaire class is a product of Black Black incapacity related to Black businesses not getting contracts in order to expand is that this lack of expansion coming from government contracts is what has us trapped in these jobs that are eating our community that we're working triple time just to be broke. And so it, it's but, a. But I, I, I want to have a hierarchy. This is all I'm saying. This is all I'm saying. And, and, is that, and again, we're. we're, we're what we are talking about specifically in New Jersey, everybody understand, I am literally in the middle of this on the black owned media side right now. So you're absolutely right. But what we had to do first was we had to fire the shot to force the companies to increase their spend. Then when we got them to increase their spend and to make the commitment while well, that's happening. We're over here helping smaller black owned companies build their capacity to what uh, uh, Sujay just said, the, the paperwork, the contracts, all stuff along those lines. But none of that matters if we don't get the commitment. So our focus has to be You just froze. Father shot and trying this needed to be this. Um, I'm still here. Can you, okay. you see me? So 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 we can see. So so let me, see let, me, me? let me do three things. Yeah. So so I, so I, so just this so you gotta get gotta we gotta get them to force the commitment and then we infield everything after that. Now, now let, let me see if I can do three things here, because it's very important that we kind of walk away with some alignment of next steps. And, and then I'm going to ask uh, that, that Freddie would kind of, you know, give us some, some closing remarks here. And, and I'm going to ask then uh, that, that we would end this in prayer. Number one, back to Dr. Richardson's point and Dr. Topper's point and others. We would like tonight to leverage the support of the persons that are a part of this panel in order to bring the kind of focus, pressure and heat in New Jersey to let the folks know that we are together in helping to support what we're doing in New Jersey. That's number one. So you will be receiving something because each, a, a lot of you all represent a large number of constituencies. If this state leadership is aware that we are aligned, I'm telling you right now, we can crack the code and get a win. Number two, we're going to have an economic justice rally in September. 
One of the things that Dr. King said was the notion that protests are good, it draws attention, but at the end of the day, it's going to take direct impact in order to cause something to happen. We are working on legislation that we're going to put on the governor's desk from the Senate to the assembly that is focused on economic justice and dismantling, if you will, the systems that we have in this state that has caused white families to have an average income per capita of 300 plus thousand dollars and black families of $6,015. That's the gap that we have in New Jersey. And so we're gonna put that on the governor's desk and we want you all support and we certainly would love to have you all support at the rally in order to ensure the fact that we're going to get this legislation passed. We get this legislation passed, it becomes then a blueprint and a model. It's going to address everything that we talked about tonight. It's going to really put policies in place. It's one thing to have the conversation. It's another thing to have the policies in place. We don't need no more studies. We don't need commissions. We don't need initiatives. What we need is legislation and policies that, that will force individuals to have us have X amount of contract, pension fund stuff, and going on and on in terms of the legislation that we're going to have. And here's the last one. We're going to float a manifesto that would simply say that if we can come together across the nominational lines, across conventions and associations, Here's what we can do together if we get that kind of an alignment. I will also kind of work with the team, the New Jersey Black Economic Justice team, to put in place a set of things that if we can teach in our various churches, we're going to recommend things that we can teach in our various churches. I mean, we ought to be having Sunday school around this. Okay. We, we, we ought to be having network groups around this. I mean, that's the kind of thing that we do need to do so that we put it where people could understand it. And we would welcome any input from any of you all as we kind of build out a set of things that folks can truly understand. Can, can, and, and we're going to send what I just said out to everybody in email form, because I think it would be a waste of you all's time tonight just for us to talk and have all of our members and all of our constituency on and us not come out of this tonight with some actionable items that represent next steps in terms of what we're gonna do. I have one question for you. Are you gonna focus only on state funds or are you, because corporate America- no, we, We're gonna cut across the board, Sujay. That's okay. a good point. We're gonna cut across the board. In fact, we're- But, but, right but, 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 here, but you gotta have- Go ahead, bro. you gotta have the wins you got to have the wins. The reason why you focus on state funds first, because your voters and taxpayers, when they see you going after the state and you get the wins, then you can ship to them as well. It's all about capacity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The best leverage right now is this is an election year. Yeah. So go for the state right now because you leverage your votes. And then when you chalk up the wins, then go, now, New Jersey corporations, y'all next. That's right. right. Got it. That's, exactly, Got it. That, that's exactly right. Listen, let me just apologize. Uh, Will it go ahead, Willie? Dr. Jefferson, I, I just want to uh, just just undermine that this this is not this is not foreign to to our governor. Even when we think uh, he campaigned on economic fairness, uh, and we we know he's failed, and we know he's failed at that so far. But the reality is that there's some folk in this country who need more than fairness, and there's some folk in this state who've been exploited more, particularly black business owners and black workers, that we don't just need fairness in our economy. We need some repair, and sometimes we need a little extra because of so much that was taken. Well, well, well said. Well said. Listen, let me just, uh, I got something from, I got something from Bishop uh, Walker. He apologized. He was trying to balance some things. So he sent us apology. Dr. Richardson had to step away. His two grandkids graduated and he needed to be with them. So he was making a real, real family sacrifice. He had to step away. Uh, but, but I can't thank you all enough. I can't thank our audience enough. Our sponsors tonight, by the way, was the Positive Community Magazine that have been in our community for years and really, really keeping us abreast, really making sure that we have the latest. They're positive in what they do. 
as well as Industrial Bank, uh, the only African-American bank in the state of New Jersey, Industrial Bank, are the folks that are really kind of helping to sponsor this tonight. And I just wanted to kind of give them a shout out and, and really thank them as well. I, I am going to ask that uh, Dr. Freddie Haynes would kind of, you know, give us a closer here, if, if, if he didn't mind. And then I'm going to ask uh, that Dr. Sujay uh, would please kind of do a closing prayer. Roland, do you have any other closing comments, uh, my brother? The marching orders is this. Each church, you must begin to collect the data on what businesses that are in your churches right now, what's their size, what's their, what's their, what's their average revenue, and the number of employees, how long they've been in business. That, you, that way you now have a church database. Once you have that, you should then be forwarding that to Pastor Jefferson so they can put that into a, 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 another database. So they can say, we are um, 50 black churches in New Jersey and these 50 black churches have 400 black owned businesses. And now you have the information. So now we're dealing with that. And then the next piece then has to be, um, then we, we, we still have got to get the data from these different agencies to know how much money is being spent so we can now articulate back to the congregation, this is the percentage that we're getting, 1% or 2% in this area, this area, this area. This area. Otherwise, we're, we're just talking blind. Absolutely. 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 Um, thanks a lot, Roland. And once again, thanks folks. Um, we really appreciate everybody tonight. Um, I think this could be a pivotal point. I think that this could be a defining moment based on what we do from here. Um, and the four things that I laid out, we'll send that to everybody that's a part of this. We're gonna send it to other people who didn't have an opportunity because we just couldn't get everybody on. This is a very hot topic. Folks are interested in this. We can make something happen here. Um, Dr. Haynes, will you kind of provide us with some closing and, uh, and uh, Sujay then will kind of give us a prayer. Okay, again, Dr. Dave, Dr. Jefferson, thank you so much for uh, your courage, your competence and for bringing us together. Thank you, Roland, for all that you do. Uh, and I'm gonna quote you a few times as I get ready, to, as, as I try to wrap this. I wrap it by reminding us of the movie Selma. Uh, and I see that as a metaphor for what we are attempting to do. Uh, Selma was one location geographically, but mm. it became the what pivot point that gave rise to what became the voting rights bill, uh, where we came from all over the country descending on Selma to march from Selma to Montgomery. And that was Dr. King's response to LBJ saying, I don't have the power uh, make me do this, make me pass voting rights legislation. And they targeted one particular area that was what egregious in terms of voting rights. And through that targeting and through that what dr dramatizing uh, the what uh, the voting injustice taking place, uh, they were able to uh, literally, again, birth voting rights for the whole nation. Now, something happened in the movie Selma uh, that I pass on to us right now that you all are familiar with. Martin is in, is in jail in Selma with uh, Ralph Abernathy. He's discouraged. Ralph says, keep your eyes on the prize. And Martin's response is, what prize? I've integrated us into a lunch counter, but we don't have the education to read the menu or the <laughs> economics to buy a hamburger. And I remix it by saying, reading the menu and owning the lunch counter. And so I think it's very important that we derive metaphorical lessons from that. Number one, let's descend on New Jersey and make a statement to New Jersey. New Jersey is right. And because of the fact, and it's really right, because again, it's democratic, it's blue as they come. And we wanna see if blue re respects black. Number two, education. One of the things that, ke that, that, that keeps driving at me in this whole conversation is we've got to increase our economic justice IQ. Too many of us 
don't know a lot of what has been shared this night in right. terms of how economic systems work. That's why William Augustus Jones Jr. in his classic book that's been again re, uh, reproduced uh, talks about understanding how the system works. Uh, Roland sent me this piece and I recommend this book to everyone. Please pick up the book by Martin Depp on Operation Breadbasket. It is a classic for how those black churches moved in Chicago to literally bring about economic justice uh, in a way that we need to replicate. Reverend Jackson and Operation uh, Breadbasket, uh, Operation Push back then, they came together and they recognized how to leverage their power economically. We still have that power economically, but we've got to increase our economic IQ. And when we increase our economic IQ, then we will have the resources to buy not just a hamburger at that lunch counter, but we can buy that lunch counter and serve up our own hamburgers. And so I appreciate uh, what we're doing. I think it's it's in our DNA to do it. So let's do what we've done. I think it was Marcus Garvey that said African people can do what African people have done. And so all we got to do is do what we've done and we can make this thing happen. And before you know it, as far as I'm concerned, another movement will be underway. And we talked about how young folk ain't going to church and all that stuff. Young folk today are more spiritual than my generation. If you checked out the uh, Olympics, uh, the Olympic trials last weekend, every black person who won first, thank God. So it ain't that they're not spiritual, they're spiritual. It's just that they're sick of a religion that does not speak to the issues they are living and confronting and dealing with every day. And we have an opportunity right here to have a witness that will impact our community around the country. And I promise you, if we get Jersey, Texas, we come in your way. I just want everybody to know that's an alpha brother right there. That, that's a he, he wrote his book. Freddie, you got to say something about your book. <laughs> that's, a, that's an alpha brother. Oh, my God. Here, oh, my goodness. There, there, there we go, Roland. Roland just put it up. Roland just put it oh, up. Boy, hey. well, Delta is in the house. Too. I got you. I, so I me, Phi Theta is in the house, too. I hear you. I hear you. So don't let me uh, just thank our. It, 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 don't, it don't matter because Jesus was an alpha. Let me thank our sponsors once more. Oh, Positive Community. Positive Community, give them a shout out as yes. well as Industrial Bank. Give those folks a shout out. And again, thanks, everybody. Sujay, close us out in prayer and have a blessed okay. evening, everybody. And right. we give you a shout out, Jeff. Thank you so much for gathering us. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever aligned and on the path. We pray, God, we pray for baskets and we pray for the bread. We thank you, God, for those who assembled us tonight, the voices that have been shared and the voices that wanted to be heard. God, we thank you for being God of 100%. And we're just thanking you, God, just as you did for the daughters of the left at, whatever has to be done, we want our inheritance. We thank you, we praise you, dismiss us from this place, but never from one another. We leave here not in chaos, but in community. That's where we go from here. In your name, amen. 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 Good, Good night, night, everybody. God, God bless, bless you. Peace. Blessings.